الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته Welcome brothers and sisters to our program analyzing the address this is where we revisit the khutbah talk about it in a little bit additional detail and offer you the opportunity to ask any questions and give any feedback that you might have regarding the khutbah and today's khutbah was actually a continuation of I apologize having some technical difficulties here I apologize so today's khutbah was actually a continuation of the topic of the diseases of the heart which we began last week and we mentioned three diseases last week and we also mentioned three diseases today and those diseases were uh, keeping bad company al ghafla or heedlessness and al nifaq or hypocrisy and so let me just begin immediately with uh, bad company just wanted to i think most of what we said in the khutbah was pretty uh, self explanatory and there's um nothing extensive that I'd like to add but I would like to add uh, an ether and a brief uh, commentary um or reflection on the ether of Ibn Abbas collected by Ibn Jarir radiyallahu anhu or rahimahullah ta'ala in that uh, ether Ibn Abbas he said man ahabba fi Allah wa abghadha fi Allah wa wala fi Allah wa aada fi Allah فإنما تنال ولاية الله بذلك ولن يجد عبد طعم الإيمان وإن كثرت صلاته وصومه حتى يكون كذلك وقد صار عامة مؤاخاة الناس على على أمر الدنيا وذلك لا يجدي على أهله شيئا so he said رضي الله عنه he said he who loves for Allah's sake and hates for Allah's sake makes friends because of Allah makes enemies because of Allah this is the only way to attain nearness to Allah a person cannot possibly taste the sweetness of faith even if he prays frequently and fasts often until he operates in this way nowadays most relationships are based in worldly considerations and that will not benefit those people anything so i just wanted to reflect briefly on this ether as it relates to the disease of keeping bad company i want us to ask ourselves brothers and sisters how many friends do we have that are friends of ours solely or primarily because of their religious commitment I want you to reflect in that roller deck I'm so that roller decks in your mind of your friends and ask you how many of those friends are friends just because of their religious commitment I'm friends with x person or y person because that person just by their commitment they remind me of Allah they make me want to be a better muslim and that's the only reason or the primary reason I'm their friend because of their religious commitment If our response to that question is none or very few or I can't think of one of them that's that that that's the case then are we loving and hating for Allah befriending and harboring enmity for Allah are we doing that as Ibn Abbas he said this is what it takes to attain Allah's friendship to attain nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the other side of the coin I want you to think how many of your friends or associates they are a bad influence they're friends for the wrong reasons that i'm not friends with this person because of their religious commitment in fact their religious commitment is every reason why i shouldn't be their friend but i still keep them as a friend how many friends do we have that fall into that category and if our answer is quite a bit many of them then are we taking the prophet's advice that we mentioned in the khutbah which he said falyanzur ahadukum he said الرجل على دين خليل فلينظر احدكم من يخالل a person will follow the path the faith of his closest companion 
So choose your, fin, your friends wisely. Are we choosing our friends wisely if they fall into that second, that second category? So it's something for us to think about and reflect on in light of the ethic of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. The second disease that we mentioned, brothers and sisters, was al-ghafla. And an example of this, or to kind of, you know, give a, 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 a picture, a, a, to create an image of this in our minds, it's like ghafla, al-ghafla, is waking up, stumbling through the day, going to bed at night, and repeating this cycle. All of that without actively thinking about Allah. Without actively thinking about our purpose in life, our status with Allah. Without actively thinking about death, the end, at least the end of our time in this world. And where we are likely to end up, if that were to happen right now, where am I likely to end up? And what can we do, since it hasn't happened, what can we do to influence the outcome and change it for the better? If we don't have this, if we're not thinking like this, if we're going day after day after day and we're not actively thinking on this level, then that's what? That's heedlessness. And some people have more of it, some people have less of it, some people are on different places in the continuum of heedlessness. But if we don't have this active thought process about these and other relative issues, then we have a certain level of heedlessness, a certain level of this disease of al-ghafla, heedlessness in our hearts. And this is a rut that many Muslims are stuck in. Religion for many of us has become a routine and rituals have become an end rather than a means to an end. We, play, we pray Salat like Salat is, is, all, is being offered in and of itself or for itself. Salat becomes an end. No, Salat is a means to an end to draw closer to Allah, to increase our Iman, to make us want to not just pray the Fadl prayer, but the voluntary prayers and other prayers to draw closer to Allah. That's the purpose of the Salat. The Salat is not legislated for itself as an end, rather it is a means to an end. But for us, for many of us, the rituals have become an end. We're just, we're just doing it because we have to, or that's what we're supposed to do. But we're not doing it with what? With a desire to use it as a tool to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to become more mindful and, re and reflective of Allah, on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, etc. So then after that, after we talked about heedlessness and the symptoms of heedlessness and what heedlessness looks like in practice, we mentioned uh, the remedies. We mentioned the remedies, and I want to revisit those and mention some of the evidences to support uh, those remedies. So one of the remedies that we mentioned for al ghafla was a dhikr, remembrance of Allah. Frequently remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Udhkur rabbaka fi nafsika tadarru'an. He says, remember your Lord internally with humility and fear and with a lowered voice, without shouting. Do this in the mornings and do this in the evenings and do not be from the heedless. It's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying is if you do this, you will not be counted from the heedless, but if you don't do this, then you'll be considered from the heedless. If you're not a person who frequently remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout your day, then you're from the heedless. But if you remember Allah throughout the day, then that what? That, that, that excludes you from being counted amongst the heedless. And obviously the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes many forms. And one form is obviously employing the formulas that the Prophet has taught us. That there are certain adhkar that the Prophet has taught us to say throughout the day. For example, there are certain what we call adhkar as sabah wal masa. Specific formulas that the Prophet taught us to say in the early morning and the early evening. There are also specific adhkar that the Prophet encourages us to say bi shakil yomi every day. So, for example, he taught us to say, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la shari kalalahu al mulku wa lahu alhamdu wa hu ala kulli shayin qadir. Every day, a hundred times. Also, for example, he taught us to seek Allah's forgiveness and repent to Him every day a hundred times. Ya ayyuhannas, 
Tubu ilallahi wa staghfiru fa inni atubu ilallahi wa staghfiruhu fil yawmi mi'ata marra. He said, O oh people, every day make istighfar. Make a lot of istighfar and a lot of repentance. Allahumma ghfirli astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Say this repeatedly throughout the day because I, the Prophet says, I say this a hundred times every day. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanallah al-azim. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. These different forms the Prophet is teaching us, we try to say those throughout the day and be from the people who what? Who are dhakirin Allah kathiran wa dhakirat. The men and women who remember Allah much. But that's not the only way you can remember Allah. Another way that's important for us to remember Allah is by reading. Reading Islamic books, reading articles online, listening, uh, you know, doing the reading material that will remind us about Allah. It's important. It's an important part of our daily routine that a lot of us have what? Have, have, have failed to what? To exercise. To have, fail to be what? Regular in, in doing. Spending, spending some time each day to learn about Allah. Learn about your faith. Learn about uh, the salat. Learn nuances of the prayer that you didn't know, etc. and so on. Because that is a type of what? Dhikr. That's a type of remembering of Allah. And also pondering over the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reflecting upon life, reflecting upon creation and the signs in creation that point to what? To the oneness of Allah, to His existence, to His power, to His mercy and compassion, etc. So these are some forms. And the best form is, the actual, is actually the second remedy that we mentioned, which is Qiraat al-Qur'an, Tilawat al-Qur'an, frequent or regular recitation of the Qur'an. Uh, Uthman ibn Affan, who the great Sahabi and Caliph of Islam, and the third Caliph of Islam, he used to say, لو طهرت قلوبكم ما شبعتم من كلام ربكم. He used to say, if your hearts were pure, they would never tire of reading Allah's words. They would never get enough of reading Allah's words. And so one of the things that will purify our hearts is regular recitation of the Quran. Every day, we have to have a word. We have to have a specific portion of the Qur'an that we read every day. And if we can increase it every day and make that word longer or larger every day, that's even better. But at least we should maintain that specific amount where we're always in connection and we always have this, um, we have this regular you know, meeting, this regular um, time that we spend memorizing it, reflecting on it, pondering its meaning, studying its meaning, etc. Uh, the fourth, I'm sorry, the third uh, remedy that we mentioned for this ghafla was hudur majalis al-ilm, that we sit in the circles of knowledge. And obviously, um, given the technological advances of our age and also given the circumstances with COVID-19, that may, may not necessarily mean that we have to be in the same place where the lecture is being delivered. That many of these lectures are done online, they're done on different platforms like Facebook, like Zoom, like Instagram, like, you know, so many other platforms. And so there are so many opportunities and avenues for us to what? To, to have time each day or regularly throughout the week where we sit in a circle of learning and we get reminded. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فذكر, in, I'm sorry, um, وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ He says, remind, because reminder benefits the believers. It benefits the believers that they sit with someone and that person reminds them of Allah, reminds them of death, reminds them of the afterlife, reminds them of their duty as a Muslim, etc. We all need that in our life. And so it's important for us to incorporate this to what? To remove this heedlessness from our hearts. Last but not least, we mentioned from the remedies is a dua. That we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, make us from the mindful, make us from those people who are mindful and to protect us from being heedless. The Prophet, one of the adhkar, the Prophet used to teach us, uh, and it was, one, it was one of the ones that he used to stress and emphasize, was the dua where he used to say, Allahumma, in, uh, Allahumma inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. He used to say, oh, oh, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, I seek your help. Help me, assist me in remembering you. Assist me in not being heedless. Assist me in being thankful of you and giving proper thanks to you and assist me in worshiping you properly. And this dua is specifically important because it contains al-isti'ana. It contains the Prophet requesting help from Allah, 
recognizing, as we should all recognize as Muslims, that nothing that we want to achieve can be achieved except with, except with Allah's help, even if we're trying to do something good, even if we're trying to worship Allah. Notice in Al-Fatiha we say, we say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَيْنَ O Allah, you alone we worship and we seek your help in worshiping you, meaning we can't do it without your help. And notice in the ayah in Surah uh, uh, Safat, Notice that when Ibrahim came to Ismail and told him that he had, he, had, he had seen the dream that he was supposed to sacrifice him, Ismail, he responded, he says, Satajiduni, Satajiduni insha'Allah min sabirin He said, oh, my father, do as you've been commanded. You will find me if Allah wills from the patient. Meaning, I want to be patient. Patient is the right, patience is the right thing for me to, for me to patient, being patient is the right thing for me to do at this time. This is what I should be doing. But I can't do it unless Allah wills. I can't do it except with Allah's help. And so this is important and critical for us to understand. We need to make dua for, to Allah to not make us from the heedless. Because even if we want it, wanting it is not enough if Allah doesn't want it for us, if Allah doesn't will it for us. And so we need to be making this dua. Allahumma inni ala dhikrika. Allahumma inni ala dhikrika. Oh Allah, assist me in being from the people who remember you and not being from the heedless. Then we close, brothers and sisters, with one final disease, and that was the disease of al-nifaq. And we mentioned at the outset, and I want to reiterate it here, that this nifaq, it takes many forms. And we see this from the different nusus, the different religious texts related to al-nifaq, where, where Allah and or his messenger depict the munafiqeen, and they depict them with different what qualities. For example, the Prophet said, إِذَا حَدَّثَ كَذَبْ when he speaks, he lies. He said, "Either wada akhlaf." If he promises, he doesn't come. He doesn't follow through. He says, "Either either tumina khan." If he's trusted, he betrays. He said, "Either khasa mafajr." If he argues, he resorts to profanity. He becomes profane, right? And he exceeds the bounds and transgresses the limits, etc. And there are many other there are other descriptions the Prophet gave in the Sunnah and other descriptions Allah gave in the Quran. So we need to understand that in the faq, it takes many forms. And we cannot limit a nifaq to a person outwardly uh, saying they believe and inwardly disbelieving. And one of the forms that it takes, we took or we saw, was illustrated uh, by Surat an Nisa, the ayah or, or, or a series of ayat that we took from Surat an Nisa and we recited and expanded upon in the, uh, in the khutbah. Ayahs number, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 60 to 63 from Surat An-Nisa. And I just want to summarize um, the contents of that ayah and the takeaways from that ayah uh, and make a few points. So, um, one of the qualities that Allah mentioned of the munafiqeen from Ayat Al-Nisa is that the munafiqeen, the people who have this hypocrisy in their hearts, they claim to believe in the Final Testament. As Allah says, "Alam tara ila ladina yezumuna anhum amanu bima unzil ilayka wa ma unzil min qablik." Have you not seen those who claim to believe in what was revealed to you, O Muhammad, and what was revealed after that? So they claim to believe in the Final Testament. Okay, okay. Then he says, "Yet the hakamuna ila taqut," but they turn elsewhere for guidance and judgment. So they say they believe, out of one side of their mouth, they say they believe in the final testament, but they turn to other sources for guidance and judgment. So this is one of the qualities Allah mentions of what? Of al-munafiqeen. One of their qualities, they say they believe in Islam, they believe in the Islamic sources, they believe in the final testament, the Quran and Hadith, but then they turn, oh, they turn elsewhere. That's a quality of what? Al-nifaq. And we need to be aware of that. Because unfortunately, some, some of us do that as Muslims, that there's an issue that Islam has spoken on. And rather than take the ruling that's contained in the Qur'an and or the Hadith, we turn elsewhere. And we find a different ruling that suits our desires. It's more palatable to, pal, I'm sorry, um, it's more palatable to us, and then we follow that instead. Another quality that Allah mentioned in these ayat is that when they are invited to follow what Allah revealed and the path of the Prophet, they shun. They dismiss, they turn away and rebut the truth. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ تَعَالَوْا إِلَى مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ وَإِلَى الرَّسُولِ 
رأيت المنافقين يسدون عنك سدودا. When they're called to Allah, they're called to follow what Allah has revealed and to follow His Messenger, they shun you completely. You'll see the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, shunning you completely. They, they dismiss you. They rebut the truth and they turn away. And we talked about in the, in, in the khutbah how they, they do this in a number of different ways. One way is by name calling. That they attack and charge the person who is calling them out. They attack that person or charge that person or attach to them a pejorative, a name, which will basically cause people, it, it will basically undermine their credibility with other people. They'll call them a name that's despicable in the eyes of people, and people will think, well, if that person is that, then I don't want any part of that. Okay, I'm not in favor of that. I'm not in favor of them because they are that. And there are different names that they use. We, we mentioned some examples in the khutbah, and I'll mention some that we didn't mention. So, for example, one of the common names that you hear nowadays is Salafi. They'll say this person, you know, oh, he's a Salafi, he's a Salafi. And they use that word as a pejorative. They use it as a disparaging remark. Um, a disparaging moniker, really, when in reality it is not. It's not. The word Salafi basically means a person who follows the Salaf, the early Muslims, the first Muslims, the ones about whom the Prophet said, nasi qarni, thumma ladina yalunahum, thumma ladina yalunahum. The best of people is my generation, Ashab Rasulullah, the companions, and then those who follow them, at tabiin and those who follow them, at tabiin They're the best, they're the gold standard. So somebody who follows them is not, some, is not bad because the Prophet is saying they're the gold standard of understanding and practicing the deen. In other cultures, they'll use other language. They'll say things like, for example, um, they'll say mulwi, they'll say mullah, and they'll give these other, they'll use these other, what they consider to be pejoratives. The word itself, it's not, it's just standing alone, it's not a bad word. These are not insulting words in and of themselves, but the way they're being used, they're being used as an insult. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says about this tactic, he says, I'm <laughs> He says, do not mock or degrade one another and do not refer to each other by insulting nicknames. And a nickname that you intend by to insult or put down the other person. How wicked it is that a person will be called by an offensive nickname after they have believed. Okay? Then we said another way that they will uh, rebut the truth and turn away is that they'll cite the purity of their intentions. And they'll basically say, we have the best of intentions, the purest, the purest of intentions, we only mean well, we're trying to do right, etc., etc. As if to say that because we have good intentions, what we do doesn't matter. If our deeds seem poor, if they seem wrong if they seem contradictory to what should be done we should be excused because of our intention but we have to understand brothers and sisters that when it comes to islam the purity of intentions alone are not sufficient so the purity of intention alone is not sufficient that beyond that we also have to have the correctness of action now we have the hadith where the Prophet said, Actions are judged primarily by intentions, but we also have the hadith of Aisha where he said, Man amila amalan laysa alayhi amruna fa huwa rad. He said, whoever performs a religious act which we have not sanctioned, which we have not legislated or prescribed, it will be rejected. So the two go together. The purity of intentions and the correctness of deeds, and these are the two pillars of acceptable worship. And they both we need both of them in order for our deeds to be accepted. The third thing that they'll do to rebut the truth and um, and turn away is that they'll claim that they are intending by their deed to reform. We're just trying to, you know, we're trying to reconcile between this and that reform. We're trying to take the good from this, take the good from Islam, put them together and produce something that's even what? Even better, something even superior. We're trying to reform and reconcile and make harmony, they'll say. As Allah says, يَحْلِفُونَ بِاللَّهِ 
in Aradana illa ihsanan wa tawfiqa. They swear by Allah. We only intended to do good and to what? And to foster reconciliation. But the question that we have to ask is, are you reforming by opposing, contradicting, and undermining Islam? This is wrong. This is not how you reform. You can't reform. You can't consider yourself doing or performing Islamic reform by contradicting, opposing, and undermining Islam. Imam Malik, ta'ala, the great scholar of the early period, he used to say, لا يسلح آخر هذه الأمة إلا بما صلح به أوله. He used to say that the latter portion of this Islamic nation, this Islamic community, will not be rectified or reformed except by the same means that rectified and reformed the first part of it. That basically the way that we get ourselves together, get our act together, is by what? Is by following the people who came before us, the early Muslims, and the same things that reform them will reform us in our day and age. We can't reform ourselves by contradicting those teachings. We have to reform ourselves by conforming to those teachings. Another benefit that we take from the ayah that I wanted to point out is how are we supposed to respond? So when people are doing this, how are we, the people who are observing it, watching it play out, how are we supposed to respond? Allah says at the end of the ayah, He says, he says, turn away from them, and admonish them, and speak to them words that will penetrate their very souls. Contrast between this, brothers and sisters, nowhere does it say that we should, they're doing these things. They're taking from other sources. And then they're saying that this is Islamic. And then we say, no, it's not Islamic. You shouldn't be doing that. And then they turn away and rebut the truth by calling us names, by um, citing their pu the purity of their intentions despite the incorrectness of their actions, by claiming that they are trying to reform and reconcile between this and that, etc. When they do that, nowhere does Allah say that we should support them in that. We should go along with them or we should applaud what they're doing. Rather, Allah says, turn away from them, admonish them, tell them that they're wrong. They shouldn't be doing this and say it in a way that will penetrate their souls and hopefully make them wake up from their, um, their, 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 their wrong ideas about Islam and come back to what the right path. So some of the lessons that we can take away from what we talked about in this section of the khutbah is that if we are Muslims, brothers and sisters, if we are truly Muslims, the Islamic sources should be enough for us, should be sufficient for us. If we're truly Muslim, they should be enough for us. They should be enough, why? Because they're perfect. And because Allah is pleased with them. Allah says, Allah says, this day have I uh, perfected your religion for you, completed my favor for you, and I'm pleased with Allah as your religion. Brothers and sisters, if Allah is pleased with Islam, how can we not be pleased with it? Another reason why we shouldn't be turning to other sources is because Allah has not forgotten anything. We shouldn't think that, okay, yeah, but, you know, see, Islam didn't, didn't address this. Islam you know, our Lord forgot to, to, to address this. Allah hasn't forgotten anything. And your Lord was not forgetful. And Allah says on top of that, that nothing was left out. He says, And we reveal to you the book as a clarification for all things. Everything we need is in the Islamic sources. We don't need to turn elsewhere. The second thing is that if, in spite of all of this, if Islamic sources are not satisfactory, they're not sufficient for us, then something is wrong with us, not with Islam. We have to realize that. At some point, brothers and sisters, if we're dissatisfied, we have to stop putting the onus on Islam, the onus on Allah. That look, I'm not satisfied, and the problem is Allah hasn't done enough to make me satisfied. No, maybe it's us. There's something wrong with us. We need to look inward instead of looking outward 
What am I doing? What is wrong with my heart that I'm dissatisfied with a religion Allah has perfected? A religion with, with which Allah is pleased? A religion which nothing has been left out or forgotten? If I'm dissatisfied, what is wrong with me? It's like a person who has everything and they're still unhappy. They're still dissatisfied. That's, that's, that's not because there's something wrong with the things that they have. There's something wrong with them. They have an issue with contentment. A third point is that regardless of this or that, we can't ignore Islamic sources on matters spoken about therein and then take from other sources instead. This is un-Islamic that if Allah has given a ruling or his messenger has given a ruling about something, we ignore that and we turn to other sources. Allah calls this a nifaq. He calls this a nifaq. أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِينَ يَزْعُمُونَ أَنَّهُمْ آمَنُوا بِمَا أُنزِلِ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ يُرِيدُونَ أَنْ يَتَحَاكَمُوا إِلَى الطَّاغُوتِ And then later on the ayah he says, رَأَيْتَ الْمُنَافِقِينَ يَسُدُّونَ عَنْكَ السُّدُودَ He calls the people who do this, who turn away from the Islamic sources when they've given us a ruling, take from elsewhere and then try to call it Islam. Allah calls that what? An nifaq <coughs> Unfortunately, it's becoming quite common. It's becoming quite common for us in our times, in our modern context, to look elsewhere, to look beyond the Islamic sources, to look elsewhere. And there are some controversial examples that I could cite. I don't want to cite them because they're controversial and also because of the time. It'll be Maghrib very soon. Um, but what I'll do is I'll allude that right now we have this fiery debate uh, amongst uh, a certain segment of our community. It is particularly, um, it is um, one particular demographic that is particularly um, invested in this debate is our young people. Um, our youth who are, for example, uh, in university, and even those who are not yet at university, those who are in high school and even in, in middle school, uh, they are actively, um, they are active proponents of certain ideals, certain um, behaviors, certain um, personal choices, etc. And those personal choices, those ideals, those behaviors, Allah has spoken about it in several places in the Qur'an, or spoken about them in several places in the Qur'an. The Prophet also has echoed what Allah has said in the Qur'an in his sunnah. And the scholars of Islam historically have unanimously given a verdict about those things. But these people have looked elsewhere and been influenced by other sources and other ideologies and so they are you know advancing actively um, promoting these things in the name of Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just to give you one example this particular these particular ideals and behaviors and um, lifestyles whatever Allah in one ayah or one set one group of ayahs he calls it he calls them Fahisha, he calls them an abomination, not just Fahisha, ma Fahishatan ma sabakum biha min ahadim al alameen. A unprecedented abomination. Unprecedented abomination. He also says that the people who do this are Qomun Musrifun, people who have transgressed. He also says that the people who refuse to do it were criticized for being mutahirun being people who want to be pure, which means the people who were doing it were considered by Allah as foul and decadent and immoral. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how he punished the people who, com who continue to commit this crime after they were warned repeatedly to stop. He said, matara. He said, we rained upon them a rain of stones. And last, he called them in closing, he called them mujrimun, he called them criminals. So we have to think, this is the ruling of Islam. If we ignore that, if we look beyond that, 
and we take from other ideologies and, and faiths and philosophies and then adopt an idea about that that contradicts what Islam said. But we still insist that we're Muslims. Allah is calling that in these ayat that we mentioned in the khutbah, calling that a nifaq, hypocrisy. And we mentioned the cure. And I'll just repeat it, Allah Ujala, because it is time for Maghrib. We need to go and pray. Um, but basically, we said what's critical for the person who wants to repent from this form of a nifaq is first we have to learn, we have to train ourselves to submit, to surrender and submit fully to Allah, to Allah's will, to and to follow His teachings as revealed. We have to train ourselves. That's what it means to be Muslim. We have to understand what the word means and understand that the word is not just a word. It's not a title which is just titular. No, it's a title that implies an action that we are supposed to perform. Submit, surrender, give up. Don't fight. Don't fight it. Allah says, you do. That's what it means. The second thing, repent from being dissatisfied. Being dissatisfied with the deen is a sin. It's a sin. It's a disease itself. And we need to remove that disease from our hearts by repenting to Allah from being dissatisfied. The third thing we said was to rectify. Because some people are actively promoting these wrong ideas. And they themselves have been influenced and they're influencing other people. They have to what? Rectify. If they've introduced corruption into the deen through promoting falsehood in the name of Islam, they have to rectify that, to correct that. They have to undo that in themselves and in others who they've influenced. And last but not least, they have to clarify openly. They have to undo what they did by saying, I was wrong. That's wrong. It's wrong to try to reform Islam. Islam doesn't need to be reformed. Rather, the Muslims are the ones who need to reform themselves. I wish I could say more, but the time doesn't permit it. But I hope that this is enough to kind of expand and give more clarity about what we intended, especially about this last um, disease, an nifaq We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in closing to bless you, to bless your houses, to bless your spouses, to bless your families, to bless your children, to make you blessed wherever you may be. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who listen to the talk and follow the best of it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who he teaches beneficial knowledge and who he truly benefits from that knowledge by making us from those who put it into practice. We seek refuge with Allah for ourselves and for you from these three diseases, keeping bad company, al ghafla or heedlessness, and al nifaq hypocrisy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify all of our hearts and make us those who meet him on the day of resurrection with qulub and salima, with pure Pure, sound hearts. Amin, amin, ya Rabbal Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak. Anabina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.